What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to episode 98 of the Lombard Trucking Show. I know it's been a while. I do apologize. It's been busy here ever since the transition. We've been running and gunning uh, heavy on the recruiting side, heavy working at Orange Theory. I'll tell you, I'm going to make a whole episode. We're going to talk about what's going on on the recruiting side of things, because let me tell you, just like the rest of the economy, man, things are just not too pretty. Uh, it's tough out there. It's a tough market for everybody. But a story for another time. Got a fantastic guest I'm bringing on today. Discovered him on TikTok. He's got a fantastic channel. He's a prior Marine, fellow Marine, right alongside with me. Also a former Texas, he used to work for Texas Department of Public Safety, worked in law enforcement for just shy of a decade. And then he got into, in specifically working with commercial vehicles, so he has, has, has his expertise there, shifted over onto the, to the company side of things for safety and compliance, and then has ventured off and is now has an accredited safety course that he teaches at colleges in West Texas. Without any further delay, I'm bringing him back on the show, bringing him to the show right now, Mr. Santiago Telemontes. Welcome to the show, sir. How you doing? Thanks, Mike. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on, man. I know it took a, a little bit from when we uh, connected and, and I never got a chance to ask you, but do you remember which TikTok you saw that you ended up, uh, you know, reaching out? Yeah, you you were posting about a there were two because you were posting heavily on a Texas House bill that people were, uh, you know, talking about that had to do with getting with worker the foreign drivers. Yeah, yeah, so with with Canadian and Mexican drivers, and then there was another one where you uh, were debunking this viral video that was going around that had to do with uh, people were trying to say that at this truck stop there was DOT officers asking for this guy's papers, like for his citizenship oh, yeah, yeah. or something. Right? Yeah, yeah. And you had made and you had given an entire synopsis about basically how number one, the guy who posted this video was probably posting it for clout. Uh, yeah. because and and being like kind of outlandish and number sure. two you 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 nitpicked every little thing about how number one this isn't even in texas because it was memphis police and then like down to the car descriptions like well if there's this many cars it's because there's probably an actual crime going on it's also like and then you also said like this is really never going to happen about asking for papers and shit like that yeah um yeah no and and what's funny man is that first video you're talking about so i was i mean i'm still con i still consider myself new to tiktok and and uh i had no idea um what you know how to even use the platform but back in april my son actually suggested it and um he asked he asked me you know he said hey you know tiktok is another way you can advertise and so he we 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 made it we made he made the first one for me and i remember he posted it and he told me okay like close the app uh don't log into it and when i logged in the next one or he might have logged in first or i logged in first but within 10 hours that video and all it was was about the upper reflective sheeting on the back of a truck and i think it was at like twenty seven thousand views or whatever and he's like bro what the hell is going like how do you have it i'm like i don't know man what do you, what do you mean like I, I don't know how this thing works and i think within two days it had gotten up to like you know two hundred thousand somewhere around there and that's the very first one and i'm this i'm brand new like i, I didn't even do it he did it for me because i didn't know how to do it and so from then on i was like okay i guess like this somehow works and um you know i haven't I, I've got to use it here and there, you know, like it's uh, um, I'm kind of like you, like I get tied up. I'd like to make more content or whatever. But, you know, like I was telling you before we got on, man, you know, I knew that when I started doing these things, it was going to turn into, you know, the the public thinking, oh, well, this is a free resource. So anytime I have a question, I can just ask this guy. And I'm like, no, man, like I'm a business, you know, like I, I don't do I don't just answer everybody's questions. Otherwise, you know, I'd never make a dollar. And uh but uh, yeah, that that house bill you're talking about, um, just to elaborate on why, um, like, so being novice to the platform, two of my students sent me a screenshot of where somebody had like downloaded it and posted it on their TikTok and it had like hundreds of thousands of views. Right. I'm like, how the fuck did they do that if 
this is my video. Well, I didn't know that you could turn off the downloads, you know, so all that, all those views that it got, I didn't get the credit for it. I didn't get the, you know, I had some followers from it, but I didn't get the the views. And uh, so I, right away I went into my settings and I turned off the ability to download them, you know, cause I'm like, no man, don't, don't make, don't, don't build yourself on something that I did. And I really didn't expect that many people to watch it, but because it's such a prevalent problem with these um, Mexico drivers being used, um, you know, I guess there were, there was a lot of companies worried, but they shouldn't have been because those drivers should have never been working in the first place, you know, and that's what led to, you know, the, the low cargo rates. And I can tell you how directly it affected me. So I, uh, I, I've done that uh, compliance manager course in Laredo more than anywhere else. I didn't do one of those classes this year on the border in El Paso, Laredo, down in the Valley. I did it. I not, I didn't do it one time. I advertised it a few times and I got either no enrollment or little enrollment. And that's how I knew like, man, there's something going on, you know, and some of the friends I'd made that, that are down there, they were explaining to me, yeah, man, the cargo rates are real bad because these companies are hiring these B1 drivers to do these point to point runs in the U S and they're paying them, you know, $12 an hour when they don't want to pay a U.S. driver, you know, 18 to 20. And I was like, OK, well, that makes sense. They're making, you know, paying a driver cheaper, but keeping the cargo rate charge for them where they're profitable and even more because they're paying less to a driver. And uh, so, yeah, it definitely had a had an effect. And, you know, I'm like I'm real happy that that we passed that bill here for, for Texas because, that should start to combat some of that. But there's two scenarios, man, that are that are going on. It's it's primarily the 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 um, the, the companies that are hiring those B1 drivers with that permit, right? So they have a Mexican CDL, but the B1 is the actual like visa to be here to be able to come into the U.S. Um, and there's that. There's that situation where instead of just doing a Mexico, an international run from Mexico into the U.S. and back, they're delivering in the U.S. and then they're going picking up another load in the U.S., delivering to another U.S. and then back. And what I was trying to explain in there in the video is that as a DOT officer, if I pull that driver over, all I, all I can make sure is that they have the proper license. I'm not immigration. I can enforce that, um, that the, the point to point rule. You know, like I can't do that. And, um, you know, I got a that. text. I, w I wanted to share this text with you on this because I got a text from a listener of the show. Yeah. And, and it has to do with what you're saying. He said, I interacted with an immigrant from Portugal yesterday who was employed by a Chicago based carrier leased on with Super Ego. Huge piece of shit company. He spoke mm. no English. He had a Mexican driver's license. He was speeding through uh, Lo Lovell, Wyoming. A state, a state cop shut him down for not having a log book, and he worked for a salary of $450 a week. And he said that I'm, I'm friends with a townie, and, and he tracked down the trooper after dinner. Like most cops, they knew that this person was probably an illegal alien and had a fake license, but the state doesn't really have any ICE jurisdiction, so he's still driving. And uh, Yeah, and, and, I, yeah, and I that's, believe that's, that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's that's a problem. You know, like and even here in Texas. Right. As a as a state trooper, if I pulled over a, a, a driver, the only thing I could really enforce was that they have the proper license to drive the combination or the truck. Right. Um, I'm not immigration now where I was down in Del Rio. If if I had a if I had a situation where I pulled over um, a an illegal driver, I could just call Border Patrol because they're all over. I mean, it's a bordering county. Right. I don't know if you remember, but Del Rio is the city where the 10,000 migrants were trying to cross over a couple years ago, like where that situation was happening. Um, and that's where I was at, where uh, that's where I was stationed at. Um, but anyway, the other scenario that that goes on is, you know, you can't have seven million people that have come into the U.S. and you don't think not one of them has a CDL. But what they're doing is that. All these this influx of the immigrants from even other countries, they're they're getting their Mexico CDL. Right. Because Mexico has a really lax process with getting their with getting uh, what they call an LFC. Done. Um, 
but it's the equivalent of a CDL here in America. And so they come here illegally, but they're still driving with that Mexico CDL, you know, because, you know, here in the U.S., because of NAFTA, you can drive with a U.S. state CDL, Mexico CDL or a Canadian CDL. So as long as they have the proper license, there's nothing that a DOT officer can enforce. Now, what's going to what changed here with us in Texas, though, in this scenario, and this is just my the again, I was giving like my perspective on the way that I think it was going to be used or, or able to be enforced is these these drivers that that don't have the work authorization. And that's what the bill required is that if you're here driving with a Mexico or Canadian CDO with a foreign CDO, but it's really directed at Mexico, you have to have work authorization. So what I what I've told everybody and all the students that have come through that have those questions is what I think happens. So like the first time I pull a driver over and they don't have work authorization, like I can't deport them. But what I would do is I place them out of service for not having a valid CDL because now they don't have work authorization. So it invalidates their CDL and put them out of service. Right. So now I have to call your company, send another driver out there that has work authorization or a U.S. CDL and have them drive that truck. Um, but you already know what's going to happen, right? The next day or that same day, they're probably going to hop, hop in another truck and start driving again. But what they don't understand is that at a service is going to stay with them. Like when I run that, that guy's license, I'm going to see the at a service from another trooper. So now the second time I pull your ass over and, and you're invalid because you can't just fix that at a service, right? It ain't like being red tagged for a bad tire that you hope have someone fix. And then you're good to get back on the road. You're not going to get a work authorization the next day. So if I pull you over the next day and the same scenario, this is again, what I would do. And what, I think of them would do now I'm violating the out of service and I'm going to impound the truck and trailer. And that should open the eyes of the company that shouldn't have never employed these guys in the first place because they didn't have authorization to be working here in the U S anyway. So I don't know for yeah, sure. No, that um, that you know, makes they're, sense. They're, but, but the problem is that's only a Texas law. It, it's everywhere else, you know, so that's why I, I immediately wanted to, you know, debunk the video because you could clearly see that was in Texas. And, um, you know, but but you have other people that will watch that video, you know, especially in the Hispanic community and 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 it'll cause ruckus with them. But it's because some dude's just posting a, a, a bullshit video trying to get views or whatever. And, um, you know, so that's why I kind of felt compelled because I'm like, dude, don't believe everything, especially when it's a driver. Like, come on, dude. And what I was trying to say in that video, too, is that, like, you know, that truck stop parking lot is private property. I can't go pull over a truck in the parking lot. Right. Like that. Good. Does that mean that it might not happen at times? Yes, because I know, like I told you earlier, there's a lot of people that shouldn't be doing that job. Um, but I'll tell you a scenario, Mike, that maybe you would have appreciated it when you when if I was to stop you. Right. So like I would roll through the parking lots. Right. Because I'd see, man, is there anyone here that got hazmat? Because I need a hazmat inspection or whatever. And if the driver was outside, I'd say, hey, look, man. I'm going to do an inspection on you so we can either do it here in the parking lot or you can get as soon as you touch the blacktop when you leave the parking lot, I'm going to pull you over. So what do you want to do? Right. And most of the time they're like, fuck, let's just do it here. All right, cool. So, but that's a different scenario, right? That's different than I just drive into a parking lot, start knocking on doors. Hey, man, I need to see your paperwork. Like that shouldn't happen. If that happens, if that ever happens to anybody that's, that listens to this or watches this, get a hold of me and I'll, and I'll coach you on what to do because that's, that's now you're getting into kind of borderline Fourth Amendment, uh, violate, Fourth Amendment rights violations because those rules aren't enforceable on, a, on private property. So you're not, so I remember hearing a while back about like, uh, that there was, I don't know where it happened, but a DOT inspectors going and waking up drivers that were asleep or whatever, like, dude, I mean, that, that kind of stuff like shouldn't be happening, man. You know, not, nothing, not that, that those kind of practices are what give, you know, those, those guys a bad name, you know, but it's because, like I said, man, there's a lot of guys that shouldn't be doing that.
No, you know? for for sure. Well, let's well yep. let's let's well let's backtrack. That's how I discovered sure. you. So you um you joined the Marines right out of high school, right? Yeah, I uh, left to Marine boot camp uh, ten days after I graduated high school. Man, on the plane to San Diego. You you went to San Diego. What you, what year was this? Uh, two thousand. Oh, yeah, 2000, 2000 you joined. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. in, I remember seeing, I watched your intro video when you explained who you are. So you would, you joined in 2000, you right. were, you, you said, uh, what was your MOS? 0311. Oh, so you were an 0311. So you were in the invasion. Yeah. 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 That, that video got me right. Like I, uh, I wanted to be an MP, but, uh, I didn't score high enough. Right. So I'm like, what else, well, what else can you do? Well, man, you qualified to do this. And they show you that video, you know, and, you know, you see the guys walking through like the, uh, you know, at uh, SOI in Pendleton, you know, and they're all, you know, got the camo paint on them. Like, Man, that looks badass. Right. You know, and then like mm -hmm. six months later, I'm in SOI sitting in a in a fighting hole with my partner getting rained on like, man, what the fuck is this? But uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I was an 0311, just a ground pounder. Um, yeah. And I went to so I just thought I was going to do an easy enlistment. Um and then, like I told you earlier, man, 10 days after I turned 21 on the way to Iraq in 2003. So, yeah, I was part of the uh, initial invasion. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Jo joining the military in 2000 seems like pretty surreal because it seemed, it's like, you know, yeah, there's, there's Desert Storm veterans training you. But, you know, to join in 2000 and then 9-11 a year later and then, you know, invading a, a country – you know, just just two yeah. short years after that, definitely a little bit more fearful because there's people in the yeah. 90s. People joined the military in the 90s. They didn't do it. To, you know, they did it as like, a, you know, as a job They you know, there was no impending war or anything like that. So it's like a yeah. scary time to join. No, you know, yeah, man. And I'm very blunt with everybody. I tell them, like, I didn't join because I was like, you know, um, overly patriotic. You know, uh, as a matter of fact, I learned I I. I joined because to be a state trooper, I, I, you either had to go to school or you had to have three years of active duty service. So that was really the reason I, I, I joined. Um, and, you know, of course, like throughout my life, I have wanted to go like at the most extreme. So I wasn't going to do the army. I wasn't going to do Navy or for like, I wanted to be a Marine. And, um, you know, I certainly didn't plan to, to, to be in combat, you know, and then like I told you, what was more fearful is now I'm in I'm a I'm an infantry squad leader at 21 years old as a newly promoted sergeant. So I, I pinned January 1st, 2003 and we're on our way to Iraq. So now it's not just a matter of, hey, like you're going to war as a 21 year old kid, but you're also in charge of these 18 and 19 year olds underneath you. And, uh, yeah, so, I mean, man, you talk about having to mature at an early age, like, man, it, it came quick for me. Like it was, it was, you know, cause I was no joke. Um, it wasn't that bad. You know, uh, I, I tell people the, probably the worst experience I had in, you know, like, it's not as an experience. I think we're having some West Texas Wi Fi issues. Yeah. We're going to wait for the internet to kick back on. We got some West Texas internet issues. He's back. Yeah. Did some issues. Yeah. All right, yeah. If it does, man, let me know. If it does it again, let me know, and I can try to switch back because the, the Wi-Fi connection for the hotel is strong. Yeah, you're, you're coming in a little yeah. robotic. He's frozen again. We cut out. It's, he's out in West Texas at the moment, Midland, Texas. The Wi-Fi out there is not the greatest in the world. No, Santiago. it's not. It, yeah, if you're out there, if you want to switch back yeah. to the hotel Wi-Fi, we'll keep this going. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I just switched back if uh, you can hear me. I can hear you perfect. Are you there? All right. Yes, All sir. Right. So you said your worst experience yep. in Iraq. Yeah, I was not showering for months. Ah, yeah. That's pro <laughs> that, I mean, ob obviously it was the combat and everything else, but like, 
the one thing that I tell people was just like, dude, I went four months without showering in 120 degree weather every single day wearing mop suits. We were in full mop for, you know, probably the first two and a half months or so. So you imagine like the swampiness that you build up. And yeah, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, I'm grateful for the experience, you know, but I, yeah. I never wanted to go back. Living off those, yeah, living off baby baby wipe showers and and whatever you yeah. dumping out of a a jug, said being near the water buffalo. But that's uh, no, I, I appreciate yeah, you man. for that. Definitely, thank you for your service. A time a time to be in, but you you got out. You spent some time in the reserves. What year did you get out? Yeah. So I did nine years total. Um, transitioned to reserve in 04, Got out in November of '09, and. Um, yeah, that's I did a that time in the reserve was exactly what you'd expect, man. It definitely wasn't for me. Um, the undiscipline that they talk about in the reserves was was it definitely was was uh, pretty pretty prevalent. And um, um, I was the only combat veteran and stuff like that, man. And I I I didn't enjoy my experience in the reserves, man. It was a it was a very unpleasant time, and. Um, yeah, I almost got stop lost a second time. I was gonna have to deploy a second reserve unit that was, and I was with the Motor T Battalion too. So I went from an O three level Motor T Battalion, and so imagine that change. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't a it wasn't a pleasant experience, man. Yeah, I got you. So it, during you know, this I time, was also, the reserve... it was also it, it was yeah, and it was like right on the borderline of where you started getting like the millennial marines the entitled marines you know that you know didn't you know didn't like stand up parade rest and stuff you know little things you get on duty like i could already start seeing the transition of like the respect you know so yeah i wasn't yeah. gonna last much longer no i don't i kind of know what you're what you're talking about I, that's that's the kind of the how when when i got to the fleet yeah we were kind of uh treated that way you know treated that way that was the assumption was that yeah we're these millennial guys these newer guys that weren't there for them and stuff i i know exactly what you're talking about now you're during your time in the marines is that when you joined law enforcement i was already a reservist when i when i joined yeah so as soon as i got off of active duty i started going to school um i uh i tried to get into the highway but right out of right out of uh, Marine Corps I didn't get in so I started working for the state actually as a correction officer at the time while I was uh, going to school um, I have a degree in math that I haven't done anything with to this day um, and yeah and then uh, then eventually when I had like the, the experience of of um, coming out of the Marine Corps so I had enough time to apply again and I had some, some college behind me. And then I had, a, you know, joined the, I had spent time with a PD for about a year. And eventually that's when a, a year later when I got into the Highway Patrol Academy and, uh, and went through the 28-week school, man. The internet. There. The West Texas internet. I'm still the internet's here. horrible, man. Yeah, no yeah. worries. So, so no, I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm my, my bad, dude. So yeah, no, I had a, I had gone to school, had my time in the Marine Corps, and then um, I got into the Highway Patrol the second time I applied and started that 28 week uh, recruit school, and you know, spent a year Highway transferred over to the commercial vehicle side. So really, so that to get to Highway Patrol, that's a 28 week course just to work for texas dps on the highways yeah and the reason sucked, sucked when i went because i had already been through this it it, it even back i think now still it's a 20-week course so the people that through the recruit school everybody goes through it like you're brand new like you've never been in law enforcement the only advantage you have is if, if you already went as someone who was licensed, you didn't have to take the state exam, but you still went through the 28 weeks. Uh, you get a week break in the middle, but it, um, you know, it wasn't it. Uh, it wasn't actually 28 weeks of training. 
because you get a weak break in the middle. But um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a long process. It's a long school, man. No, that's awesome. So twenty eight week course, you're out on the highways, and then you went from the school right into commercial motor vehicle enforcement. No, so when you graduate, everybody has to be trained as a basic highway patrolman. Um, some some guys go in guaranteed that as soon as you come off of the training program from highway patrol, you go right to the commercial vehicle side. Um, I got off of training, spent six months highway patrol in the actual service, and then when I hit my year mark is when I transferred because you had at back then you had to wait to hit your year mark before you could transfer to another duty station or to another service. So all I did was I transferred from highway patrol over to a commercial vehicle. Nice. Now, is, uh, uh, this is a friend of mine who's a state police officer in Connecticut. He considers going to commercial vehicle enforcement because he thinks the uniforms are better. Is there anything that let is, is alluring for a Texas, uh, Texas officer to go to commercial vehicle enforcement? Is it better pay? Is it cooler uniforms? No. So I'll, I'll tell you what kind of piss, pissed me off at the time I switched over. Uh, for some of your your listener audience that's, that's been in a called license and wait. And the first, the first patrol vehicle I had when I transferred over was this piece of shit F-150 that would that would top out at 99 miles per hour you know and before <laughs> before you can before you can stop trucks you know on regular duty because you know you have a training partner but you can't stop trucks if you haven't been through the schools right so there were some days that my partner who trained me if he took days off and i still had to work well i had i was essentially just doing highway patrol work and uh man so I went from driving a Crown Vic to that F-150, dude, and there was times like I'm trying to pull someone over that's doing five miles over the speed limit, and hell, it take me 10 miles to catch him, you know, because that damn F-150 was stuck, and, uh, you know, like, so it take me, I'm like, hey, and I pulled you over, yeah, like 10 miles back, you were doing five miles over the speed limit, so so embarrassing, man, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and back then, too, like, it was before you know, everybody went, switched over to these LED light bars, right, so the, so the, uh, the F-150 I had it still had the old halogen bulbs with the rotating mirrors right and uh the truck i had it had this issue where when you when you would turn on the rear flash right like you pull someone over and then you would hit your rear flashers so that the 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 public motoring the the cars coming up behind you knew you were stopped right but you turned off the front rotator so so it didn't blind you but when i would hit those the one side would get stuck and it would make this real loud buzzing sound like super loud. So what I would have to do is I have to stand on the side of the truck and I'd have to slap the top of the light bar. So it would start flashing back and forth again. And uh, what, one time that my, I had my Sergeant with me, he was doing what we call a check ride, right? He was like a performance evaluation and I pulled the car over. I opened my door and that loud buzzing is there. Right. And he looks over me like, what the hell is that? I'm like, Hold on, Sarge. So I stand on the stand on the doorstep. I slap the top of the light bar, and it starts flashing back and forth. And he's just laughing. I'm like, dude, this is what you got me to drive. But uh, anyway, so when back then, when it was licensed and what, um, I think it was in 03 when the transition went. But they actually used to be. They used to have a gray patch on their uniform. So the the highway patrol had a red patch, and the license and weight guys had a gray patch. So. Um, you know, you would hear old stories of like, oh, yeah, man, that's a that's an L&W guy or he's a gray patcher. Um, but in 2003, the the department decided or they they de they decided to combine both services just in the into the Texas Highway Patrol Division. And now for and since then, everybody wears the same patch. Uh, there was also the distinguishment back then that we were in trucks, we were in pickups, they were in cars. And like uh, my so my second vehicle then was a Chevy 1500, a little bit nicer than that F-150. Um, and then eventually we were the first ones to trans, trans, uh, transition to the to the Tahoes. And um, even back then, you could tell the difference be, be, because the the commercial vehicle guys were in Tahoes and the and the highway patrol guys were still in cars. 
And so that was the distinguishment we had, right? Like, no, I'm, I'm DOT, man. I'm in the, I'm in the Tahoe, you're in the car. And we, I always also like you, there's always been this internal battle between like, Oh, we're the highway patrol, you're DOT. Right. And, uh, what the way I was talks back to them is it's a, well, you know what, man, we're the varsity, you're the JV because I can play on your team. I can do your job, but you can't do mine. So that was just a way of kind of shit talking, you know, between the services. But uh, yeah, now and now you can't tell them apart because they're all in SUV. So, um, you know, one of the frustrations I had, you know, when transitioned to everybody being in, a, in, in SUVs is there was, there was times that a highway patrolman would get asked a question about the DOT stuff. And because they don't want to look like uneducated, they would give them a BS answer, you know, knowing like you don't know the answer to that question instead of just like saying, hey, I'm not a CBE guy. Let me call one of the guys or whatever, because they have too much pride. But yeah, these days, I mean, it's hard to tell between the two. These days, like usually the guys you see or the guys or girls that you see in the uh, expedition or what is that? Is it a the, no, the, the experts? Those are highway patrol the DOT guys are in a Tahoe, right? And that's because you got to be able to, you, you carry that extra equipment and that stuff wouldn't fit in, uh, in those small explorers. But that, but okay. now you can't tell them apart, but yeah, there is no, there's no, there, there's no difference in pain, no difference in uniform. Um, you're just either in the, you're in the Texas highway patrol division and you're either in the highway patrol service or the commercial commercial vehicle enforcement service, but there's no higher pay. Everything is based on your seniority, man. Like, Every four years is when you test to move to the next step or to pin on rank or whatever, but it's until you pin rank or move in step that you get a pay raise. You don't get a pay raise uh, transitioning to the CBE side. Nice. So uh, I guess for, for the drivers who are listening, especially mm -hmm. if they're in a place like Texas, because I know that uh, the LaSalle mm -hmm. County uh, rest area is a hot spot for Texas DPS, uh, especially for pulling over trucks. Uh, I know that from mm -hmm. personal experience as well. So for any of the drivers out there, what are good ways to, I guess, what's the best way to, to not, to not get, not get pulled in for, for an inspection? How do you, how do you stay clean? Ooh, man. So I actually think, or what, or what the, are you looking for? You mentioned that uh, before you're like, there's this things you look for. Yeah. 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 So real quick though, I actually think the scale house in Medina County 35 between seven, and Laredo is actually the that's the one that I hear is more notorious than anywhere else. But uh anyway, oh, yeah, that specific scale house is, yeah. But yeah, I know, the scale no, house, I just, yeah, yeah, it's in more Texas, just it's in Medina County and more. Um I actually used to go there to do my bus inspections because they had the pit. But uh anyway, man, there's not really anything that stands out, you know. Like after a while, you kind of get to know who you should stop and who you shouldn't, you know, and uh you and, Everybody, like everybody talks smack about like CR England and Swift and Landstar, right? But I tell you what, you pull them over, you don't find equipment. They may have an inexperienced, crappy driver, but their equipment is immaculate, man. You look at like uh, HEB, Coca Cola, JB Hunt, you don't find it's you don't you waste your time pulling those over, man. Um, but the myth about like. Oh, my truck's dirty. They pull me over. No, that's not true, man. Like to me, if a truck is dirty, that's a working truck. Um, but there are some things that'll stand out. I mean, dude, it doesn't a trained eye. Like, you know, a, you know, a piece of junk, you see it. Like, I'm sure even you might going on the interstate, there's a truck that passes you and you're like, man, if I was the attack, pull that thing over. So it just, there's nothing, anything that really stood out for me, man. It was just a matter of like, if that truck, look like crap or i can already see multiple violations like the sheep um, well i was going to pull it over i mean but there's not i mean there's not really you know not maybe not everybody has some people have their pet peeves but i mean one thing that always stuck out to me we did talk about the reflective sheeting like if i saw reflective sheeting violations i already knew man this this guy might need to be educated a little bit so um but not anything you know like will really stand out. I mean, one, I take that back. You roll by and you got window tint, your ass is gonna get pulled over, right? Like, I mean, there's some things that you, you know, no, you're you're getting stopped. You're getting educated today. 
Okay, but, uh, good to know. I'll yeah. Take, but, but, but after I did pull someone over, I'll tell you my personal pet peeve uh, and something that the drivers don't pay attention to. When I got handed a permit book, It does expired insurance cards, expired registrations. That's when time in. You froze did you, on did me you for catch any of that? Yeah, go ahead and repeat that back. Did you catch any of that? No, I missed it. You froze so up on my me. pet peeve was the permit book so when the permit book that oh this internet man um no so the my West my West pet peeve was the permit book yeah, my pet uh, peeve was the permit book, the permit book. yes because when i got i opened that up and you got a bunch of expired paperwork and you know if does from five years ago and from three years ago like i didn't wait time in the rest of it man when i handed the permit book that had everything in protective sheets it's in order it's it's, uh... yes yeah Yeah. you, you were cutting out a little bit but the permit book itself is the most important there and yeah, that's yeah. The, the carrier that yeah, I was. Pay attention for. to that. That was that was my peeve. If you if you're not taking care if you're not taking care of paperwork, you're not taking care of the equipment on it, right? Like paperwork, simple, you know. And, and that's one of those frustrating violations on the company side. Man, the driver leaves the yard, they got uh, an inspectors when we if they check the book before they left. Yeah, the permit book is definitely important. The carrier I was with last, you had, we had these nice binders. Everything was like folded up nice and neatly with every single alcohol mm-hmm. thing. Every single permit was lined up there nice and tight. So the, keeping the permit book, just being able to hand that right to the DOT guys is a, is a good way to come off your back quickly. Yeah. Yeah, and that was just, that was just my that that was just you know everybody has their own um everybody every inspector has their own but that was just mine and it wasn't a pet peeve it was just like i knew when you handed me that type of book i would draw every or your truck and there has I got you. So the permit book is from there. How's the how's the internet looking on your end? Yeah. I mean, it's just it looks about the same, man. I mean, it's there's it goes from two bars to three bars. I mean, even the hotspot wasn't uh it wasn't really it wasn't really helping out. So yeah, you're yeah. coming in. You're coming in mad. You're coming in robotic a little bit. I feel bad because we're live. There's some people deal. participating on LinkedIn too. But all right, let's uh, let's keep trucking oh, forward. Man. Sure. So you do your time with DOT. You mm-hmm. do yeah, and then all you before we got on the show, you said there was a certain time that happened in 2020 where you decided to break away from from law enforcement. You said I was going to leave. What ha- now? What happened there? Because you're not still in law enforcement, so what got you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was it was actually back in 2012. It was a a, a wreck that I worked, and um, the company that I worked the 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 wreck that uh, the company that owned the truck that had the wreck, um, you know they they had reached out to me. I uh, was visiting with one of their higher ups uh, that was down checking on their office in Carrizo Spring Week. And they were the ones that made me um, offer to come work for them on the company side. And you know, like I said, man, at that time, I was at my highest level of frustration with the state. And they just caught me at the right time. Now, 
uh, what I tell every every when I tell them the story that I told you earlier is that it's all God's doing and like what I'm now is what I was destined to do even though when I got in uniform I thought I was going to be doing that job for 20 years um but uh I know that God put me here for the impact that I'm making and helping carriers and drivers out on the company side so it was actually in 2012 when I left started working on the company side um cross trained to be a safety guy at the same time and then you know it was in 20 it was in 20 when i had uh decided to work for myself and you know be sort for companies on the you know instead of managing program just for them Got it. Broke up. Yeah, you broke up a little bit there. So you you worked an accident in 2012. You meet a guy. He brings you over on their comp on the company side to work for their safety department. Ah, this internet. Well, for those of you guys tuning in live, I do apologize for the technical issues. Santiago's logging off. He's coming back on. So just a little recap here. He spent some time with Texas DPS. He does several years there, about seven years. And then he was working an accident. We spoke before we got on the show. He was working an accident. Uh, it was a rollover, Carrizo Springs. Carrizo Springs is... Uh, there's a lot of oil and gas down there. Carrizo Springs also has uh, a large detention facility uh, for I illegal immigration. And the, at that crash is when he meets somebody who then recruits him to work for his company. And at that time, he was dissatisfied with his chain of command. This was the story he was telling telling me. He didn't like the chain of command kind of seemed from what it sounds like to me. It sounds like kind of a good old, sounded like a good old boys club. Looks like Santiago is logging back on. We're going to bring him back on the show. Hopefully the internet is all good now. Appreciate you guys. And he's back. Oh, your sound is off. Or at least your microphone was off. Oh, I heard a click. There you are. Up. I can hear you now. Anybody? Yeah. All right, there you are. Here. Uh, this internet is tough. I've had this happen to me before when I was recording with a fellow recruiter too, some weeks ago, where I, I had the bad Wi-Fi in California. Well, anyways, so like I said, I'm going to, sh the show must go on despite technical issues. Uh, so he went to that rollover accident. He gets recruited to work on the safety side for a company. And that's when he goes to work for compliance for companies. Now, when it comes to motor carriers, especially, and I, you know, I only had one truck. And so when I bought my truck, you have to go through things like getting apportioned plates. And so, and one of the reasons why I didn't get my own authority right away was because of the compliance stuff and the price and costs that come with it. Because when you become a motor carrier, you have to do things like join a drug consortium, uh, the UCR, getting the plates, all this other sort of stuff. And so that's just one truck you need to do that as a motor carrier. He goes over on that side and starts doing it for this company. Right. We're going to bring it back on once again. There he is. Right. Yeah. 
You good now? Yes, sir. Coming in a little bit more clear. Okay. Yeah, I was telling you that, man, if you help me tomorrow, I've been perfect because I'd be able to get the better. It's just a story of if I guess that works. Oh, I'm still live. Uh, I might have to, we might have to reschedule this one due to the, due to some technical difficulties talking about safety but the first half uh, of this show you can uh, you can catch it well he's texting me now let's reschedule anyways this episode only going to be on YouTube LinkedIn and Twitter I won't drop this one on Spotify uh, but be, I think the first part of our conversation is very valuable. We'll probably, I will redo this with him live, uh, and we will get this episode out because it's really good what he's doing. So for those of you who tuned in on LinkedIn and YouTube and Twitter, I do very much appreciate it. Um, before I let you guys go, go find Santiago Telemontes on TikTok. He has a great profile. What he currently is doing is he owns a safety and compliance company. And they said, and I'll kind of give the short synopsis of it, but basically he went from working for Texas DPS, then went on the company side. And then while he's working for a company, he was, you know, he was having a conversation with somebody giving him information about, you know, what to do for these DOT inspections, et cetera. And this gentleman had told him, he was like, Hey, why don't you, uh, you know, you should be getting paid more for this, or you should do this on your own. And he kind of ventured off and started doing this and start. And at first he was looking to try to get contracts to do this with companies. And then he said, well, wait a minute, let's bring this in. Like, instead of fighting for contracts, why don't I, you know, why don't I put this together as something he can teach? Now, mind you, also, this kind of happened at a perfect moment where he was not perfect because he was laid off. He was laid off from a good job during COVID. And after he was laid off is really when he started to, to branch out. But essentially, that's what he's doing now. He has an accredited course taught at colleges out in West Texas. And he gives these to now hundreds of people. First time he taught the class was very few. And now he gives classes up to 300 people all throughout the state of Texas regarding DOT safety and compliance. And really the CYA, the cover your ass for going to court. It was, it's really valuable information. It's awesome stuff. I'm looking forward to bringing him back on the show. Hopefully when he's away from Midland or at least has some better Wi-Fi. but I'm going to keep this recording up on LinkedIn, Twitter, and it'll be on YouTube. I'll get a full episode with him very soon. I'm also going to make another episode. So this is an episode 98. This was just some fooling around for the evening. Uh, but appreciate you guys who tuned in. Stephanie, I see you on LinkedIn. Appreciate you tuning in, uh, sticking out for this conversation. Before I sign off, though, if you guys did listen to all this, he did say if you're a driver out there, one of the biggest things that will help you in case you get stopped by DOT is having a solid put together permit book. We did this at Warren Transport. They gave you a nice binder with a zipper around it. Beautiful. And it had like, and it was all laminated. You had all your permits, nice folded up. You give that to a DOT officer. I did that at, at the LaSalle County rest area right off 35. And the officer couldn't have been nicer to me. Uh, he, you know, just, he, he, you could tell that he loved to see it because it made his job so much easier and he was out of my hair in 15 minutes. It was, it wasn't that much. It was just a quick, uh, you know, lights and tires type thing. But anyways, to be continued with Mr. Santiago Talamantes, check him out on TikTok, post a lot of valuable information. He's a very valuable resource. Awesome guy all around. We're going to do this again very soon. I'll catch you guys on the next one. Take care.